the rest of us, I invite you to turn to the book of Matthew in the New Testament, particularly chapter 4. Like I mentioned last week, we're skipping around just a little bit, so that we can time up, uh, well, actually, we're going to spend some more time in the Sermon on the Mount, that's the real reason why we're going to kind of jump around a little bit here, and then we're going to uh, jump forward uh, at the time of Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and Easter to go through those narratives in Matthew, and then we're going to jump back and follow the chronology of Matthew through that. So we're going to be in chapter 4, we skipped over chapter 3, we'll get back to it uh, sometime this year, Lord willing. <laughs> chapter 4 is a fascinating passage, um, and like we'll do with some of these uh, messages in the future, uh, we'll share a little bit of our experience with Shara and I that we had in Israel. There's pictures that go with this. So some of this is a visual experience, just to give you some visual understanding of the passages that take place here. Because sometimes seeing where these uh, stories take place can help us experience them and enter into them uh, a little bit better. And so, um, if you can put up a few of these pictures from Israel, let me just start with a map, just so we can orientate ourselves where we're at here. And where chapter 4 is going to take place. So you see at the top there, the Sea of Galilee. And at the end of the chapter 4, that's where we're going to end up, at Capernaum, which is at the top of the Sea of Galilee. But the bulk of the text is going to be about the temptation of Jesus Christ, the temptations of Jesus Christ. And that happens by Jericho, right there, at the bottom toward the Dead Sea, up there. You just follow the Jordan River all the way down. So if you go to the next picture... For those of you who have the three-dimensional version of this a little bit better, the words are smaller, you're not going to read them. This is just the exact same picture as the previous one there. You've got the Mediterranean Sea, you've got the Sea of Galilee, but here you have Capernaum listed in there. So you can see that toward the top. You've got the Jordan River Valley coming down, and then you have Jericho on the left-hand side. All right, so what happened in chapter 3 is Jesus was baptized. Okay, very, very important. We kind of skipped over one of the most important chapters in Matthew, the baptism of Jesus Christ where he is identified by the Father, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Very, very important to understand that, that Jesus has been identified by the Father as the Son of God in whom he's well pleased. His identity has been revealed, and that's going to be part of the setting going into chapter 4, the testing of Jesus' identity as the Son of God, as the Savior of the world. Next picture is another three kind of good picture of this. This is important to see because this is the wilderness that is being talked about in the temptations of Jesus Christ. When he goes from Jericho to Jerusalem, it's through this mountainous kind of, it's more hillish area for us. We're used to 11,000 foot mountains. These are more hillish um, kind of things. But this is the journey he takes from Jericho over to Jerusalem. In fact, one of the temptations is going to be at Jerusalem, at the temple. Um, we'll take a look at that next picture here. So that is the Judean wilderness. That picture we just looked at from Jericho to Jerusalem, that's what it looks like. I don't know what you picture. It's desolate. There's nothing growing there. It's desert. But it's not flat desert as you might think around here. It is this uh, hilly terrain that Jesus was, was, was in. So next picture. So this is the Mount of Temptation. This is Jericho is right below this. Traditionally, it's believed that this is where Jesus went. He just didn't wander out in the desert for, for 40 days just wandering around. It's believed that he kind of hunkered down into a cave uh, for most of that time and fasted and prayed uh, during that time. And traditionally, that's in this hillside there. If you can look real carefully, there's holes in the, the hillside. There's, there's caves there. Next picture. And you can take a gondola up there. Well, here's an entrance to one of the caves. And you can go back into here. And again, traditionally, it goes back to the second, third century. It's believed that this is possibly where Jesus hunkered down and was tempted by the devil. Next picture here. That's actually the cave that is commemorated and memorialized, if you will, as the place that Jesus lived, if you will, for the 40 days while he was in the desert fasting and praying for that. And at the end of that, where the devil comes to, to tempt him. So you can actually see the place where they think, now somewhere probably in there, whether it's here or not, is not relevant. It's the fact that he was in a physical place much like this. And I don't know about you, but it helps me uh, experience that a little bit more next. 
Oh, and then we went to a restaurant. It's called Temptation Restaurant. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> they had great food there. They tempted us with great food, and uh, we gave in. <laughs> uh, wonderful. Next one. So this is Capernaum. We're going to see the text that Tom's going to read here shortly. That Jesus moved from Nazareth to Capernaum. And Capernaum became his headquarters for his ministry for the three years. So this is the ruins of Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee. And that spaceship looking thing in the background is a building that's built over top of what is believed to be Peter's house. Peter, the Apostle Peter, lived in Capernaum too. That's where he was from. But this is where Jesus lived. So these walls here, these buildings, this is where Jesus hung out for three years. Um, it was an outpost. Actually, he went out to all the different places to preach. But this is where he came back and called home for three years. Next. This is the synagogue at Capernaum. And without a shadow of a doubt, Jesus taught and preached here. No doubt. This is where Jesus actually would, would teach uh, about who he is in the kingdom of, of God. Now, show the next picture. It's a little deceiving here. So you see the two layers there, the dark layer and the light layer? The dark layer is near the foundation of what Jesus would have been on. Okay, so years have gone by. It's been ruined. People have built up over it again. But the lower foundation, that dark level there, that would have been the synagogue level that Jesus actually walked and talked and taught, taught from. Next. And then this is the Sea of Galilee, right below Capernaum. So that village right there, you just take a few steps out. This is the shore of the Sea of Galilee, where the disciples are called from. So we're going to hear that portion in this chapter 2. As Jesus walked along the Sea of Galilee, that's where he was walking, right there. And we happen to catch a beautiful sunset looking to the west. Um, from, from there. That's the last one, right? Oh, Jerusalem. This is Jerusalem, because that's part of the story, too. One of the temptations, the devil takes Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple. Now, the temple's no longer there, but you can see that the bottom left corner of the wall there, there's a valley that's below that. And when the temple was built there, that would have added some more height to that. So when it's talking about going to the pinnacle of the temple, you're talking close to 200 to 300 foot drop down into the valley. And the spectacular feat that he was tempted to do, that'll give you a little bit more of a visual of what that, that looked like um, there. Okay, so with all those pictures in mind and some of the background story about the identity of Jesus, I'm going to invite Tom Herder to come forward at this time. He's going to read chapter 4 to us in its entirety. Apologies already, because I think I put it up here in ESD, and you're probably going to be going up NIV, huh? Yes, be a little bit of it, but not much. Okay. Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered, it is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All of this I'll give to you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and the angels came and attended to him. When Jesus had heard that John of the Baptist had been put into prison, he returned to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake uh, in the area of Zebulun and the Naphtali, well, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, um, the way to the sea along the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven 
engineer. As Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father, and followed them. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffered severe pain, demon possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Here in Turkey. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. So where we're going this morning is we're going to look at faith, following, and fighting. Which will lead to the fame of, of Christ. Now, first of all, the faith that I'm talking about, just to make sure we're clear, it's not yours or my faith. It's the faith of Jesus Christ. This passage is about Jesus of Nazareth and about his sinlessness and the importance of that. We're going to get a story about righteousness. Okay, what is a big fancy word? What, what is righteousness? <coughs> Acting right according to God. Morally acting right according to God. Right standing before God. Um, doing what is right before the eyes of God. All the ways to, to kind of say the same same thing. That's what the story is, is largely about and where we're going to go and spend most of our time this morning on. But before we do that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. That it is alive and active and that it can cut to... Uh, the deepest parts of who we are to expose um, our sinfulness, to expose our need for a Savior, to expose um, what we need um, in and through you. And so this morning I pray that we be open to the work of your Spirit in our lives as we seek to be better followers of yours in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Uh, amen. So back in June of 2017, a man did what was thought was absolutely impossible. This man was born in Sacramento in 1985. He was a young man. He went to Vera Loma High School. And many of you know who this man is. He's uh, well known in these parts. This is Alex Honnold. And if you don't know him, he did something that is spectacular is a word that doesn't capture what he did. Some of you might say it's absolutely insane and stupid and idiotic and foolish what, what he did. But he scaled El Capitan solo without any ropes. Now, I'm sure those of you who have been to El Capitan, you know how insane that is and crazy that is. So some pictures of, of uh, his scaling of El Capitan. I think we have those. So it's called the impossible climb because no one in the world had ever done it. No one ever thought anybody could ever uh, do it. But he did it on June 3, 2017. Go to the next picture. We'll go through these pretty quickly. But to just give you a perspective of what he did. So he said, oh, he just climbed a rock. Well, yeah, he climbed the biggest rock in the world that nobody thought could ever be climbed. It's insane. That's, can you have yourself on there? Not me. I'm already shaking looking at that. Next. Yeah, that's part of the climb of El Capitan going up there. One little slip. And some of those slips, he's, he's just holding on by min millimeters of rock and, and forth. Next one. In the same area, but I, I like that one. Half them in the background, give you a little perspective of what's going on. At least if he falls, he's going to fall with a beautiful view going down. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. I was a little more. <laughs> Next. And then there's like one more I think there is. I don't know how many of these I put in there. I was just mesmerized by it. But is that the last one? Yeah. On him. Okay. Alex Honnold, he did the impossible. He did something that uh, no one else had ever done. In many ways, he, 
allows us to see in a, maybe a new or a fresh way what Jesus accomplished. And obviously, Jesus is much more than Alex Honnold, right? He accomplished something that no human being could possibly accomplish. But his feet, Jesus' feet, is infinitely more astounding than what Alex Honnold did. And I, I sit there just amazed at this. I, I almost want to worship Alex for what he did. Now, that same kind of awe toward Alex is the same kind of awe we ought to have to Jesus Christ for what he accomplished. And if we don't have that, sometimes we've, we've lost perspective of what Jesus did. Now, this story in Matthew 4 helps us gain perspective of what Jesus accomplished. Because this passage is all about Jesus of Nazareth and his sinlessness. Or the fancy word that Paul is going to be using is his righteousness. So the main thing to take away from this passage today is Jesus is the righteous one. Jesus is the one who does not sin. And that's important because he had to be sinless in order to save us. And that's the whole point of what's going on here and why uh, Matthew points this out. Right after his calling, are you really the son of God? Notice what the devil does in his temptations. Questioning his identity as the son of God. As he's going out to, to be the Lord and Messiah, the devil's trying to thwart his plan through the temptation of Jesus. And what we're seeing here is the humanity of Jesus Christ. The humanity of Jesus Christ. That's what we have to be focused on. And Jesus was 100% human, like you and I. He was tempted in every way, like, like you and I. Okay, so this is important to understand. Oh, he's divine. This was easy for him. This was not easy for him. He goes out in the desert. He's fasting. And back in those days, you could fast for 40 days. It's, it pushes you right at the brink of the complete breakdown of your body. But they train themselves in fasting. For us, they'd probably kill us after two weeks. We're not used to that. But the body can go 40 days without food. It can't go 40 days without water. It needs water. So Jesus obviously had water during that time. But he's fast. His body is broken down. I mean, everything about the story is to show the humanity of Christ. He's at his weakest. He's broken down physically. And you and I both know when we get hangry, what happens when we're hungry? Right? We get hangry. You know that commercial, the Snickers commercial? Yeah, the Snickers owes me a little bit of money now. The Snickers commercial, we talk about that. Yeah, we get hangry. We get mad. We get our, our emotional state breaks down. We're more susceptible to, to sin. And so this whole scenario is showing the susceptibility of Jesus as a human being to sin, and that he was actually really tempted, like you and I, and that he actually had to live a life of faith, that he had to trust the Father, trust who he is, that what the Father said to him, that you are my beloved son, and who I am well pleased, Jesus had to believe that as a human. And as we say that if Jesus really couldn't have been tempted, then this whole story is a sham. Why even put it in there? Jesus could have been tempted. He was human. And so he was tempted. And these temptations, I don't have time to get into all the particularities of, of that. We'll, we'll flesh some of this stuff out as we go through Matthew. But there's three of them. And they get out the three main temptations that we face. Turn a rock into bread. This is really what John gets at of the desires of the eyes. Or excuse me, the desires, the desires of the flesh. My bad. Desires of the flesh. And this was a temptation for Jesus because he could have used his divinity, divinity over his humanity. And every time he got hungry, let's just make food. Anytime he, he finds any problem with uh, confronting a temptation, a desire of the flesh, he could have used his divi divinity to just shortcut and dive into it and subverted his mission of faithfulness to the Father as a human being in his righteousness. And so he doesn't do that. He says, man must live by every word that comes from the mouth of God, basically. Not just, not just bread, but that the word of God is written. It is written. It is written. So Jesus is acting as prophet here to go back a couple weeks. That prophet, it is written. He's being a prophet here. This is what we do as disciples. We go to God's, God's word. So the, the desires of the flesh are the first area of temptation that we face as human beings. 
Sexual immorality is one of the main ones in today's world of the desires of the flesh, given into pornography or sexual addictions and so forth and so on. Um, that's what we're talking about here. Gluttony is another one. In America, we struggle with gluttony because we have so much. And we give in all the time. That's what's being talked about here. The other one is throw yourself from the pinnacle of the temple. What's he trying to get out here? Do something spectacular. Do something that requires a miracle to save you. Let the world know who you are. Don't go to the cross. Don't do everything that you need to do. Get your followership through doing the spectacular, like jumping off there. Now, Jesus is going to do spectacular, right? In fact, we see this hinted at already in this passage, that he's going to not only teach, but he's going to heal. He's going to start healing people and preaching about the kingdom of God and doing some of those miracles. But other people have healed people. Other people have brought people back from the dead. That's not unique to Jesus. What's going to be unique to Jesus is what he did on the cross and being raised again from the dead. And in this passage, what is unique to Jesus is what? We often overlook this. Is sinlessness. I want you to think about this for a moment. If he gives in to one sin one time, anywhere or over his morally culpable life, meaning that he knows what right or wrong is and he has a choice to make over right or wrong, anywhere along that path from eight years old, seven years old, six years old, ten years, I don't know where it is for, for him, until he's 33 and dead, this whole redemptive salvific plan in the trash, tank it, dead, gone, over with, no good news, one slip up, one failure. Now, that would be mind-boggling. More mind-boggling than Alex Honnold trying to call Capitan. I can't even fathom getting through an hour hardly without sinning or being tempted to, to sin here. So that's what's going on. Jesus' sinlessness. He's being tempted. The first one, the desires of the flesh. The second one is the desires of the... Well, actually, John says the pride of life. Doing something spectacular. Get people to look at you. Jesus was being subversive. He was humble. He was a servant. He was going to go to the cross and be crucified. He wasn't going to be this King Messiah that is going to arrogantly rule down um, over people and demand to be followed. Followership is always an invitation. And that's the portion here too. Come follow me. Come follow me. It's an invitation. It's not a command. Well, actually for them it's a command. It's in the future an invitation to us. So desires of the flesh, desire of the eye, uh, uh, oh man, we just mixed up. Sorry, slow down. Desires of the flesh with the bread and the stone, the pride of life with doing the spectacular from the temple, and then the, the last one is the desires of the eyes. He shows them all the kingdoms of the world, right? A spectacular sight to see like, you know, I'll give them to you if you bow down and worship me. Jesus says for the third time, on a first place, says, get away from me, Satan. It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only. So we get the three areas of temptation that we all face. The flesh, the eyes, and um, the pride of, of life that we have here. And so this is a, a rubric to be able to see our own temptations, our own sin. But first and foremost, to see the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. He becomes our righteousness. Now, how important is this? Well, if you read through the epistles... All the rest of the books in the New Testament outside the gospel, you're going to see this thing come up over and over and over again. It's the basis of our justification. Another big word. To be made right before God. To be justified before God. is all because of what Jesus did in his life. And this temptation scene points us to that. So here's some verses. I just want to pull some of these verses out just to show you uh, this. So, 1 Peter 2.22, very simple, straightforward. Just to reiterate what is being said here and shown here in story form of Jesus Christ. Jesus committed no sin. There it is. Neither was defeat, deceit found in his mouth. Committed no sin in his heart, in his actions, nor <coughs> verbally. The next one. In 1 John 3.5, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins. Talking about Jesus again. And in him, there is no sin. So, black and white. Pretty close to crystal clear. It goes throughout the scripture. Jesus is sinless. Next. Hebrews 4. Now it starts to tease out what this means and why that's important. 
For we do not have a high priest, Jesus as priest, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So think about all the temptations that you face. Says so Jesus faced all of them. He faced it lust and envy and greed and pride and sloth and anger and all these temptations, the seven deadly sins Jesus faced. But he never gave in. Now think about that for a moment. This is profound. You and I, we give in to temptations all the time. So we don't know the full force and weight of a temptation because we give in quite a lot. Jesus never gave in. He pushed the temptation as far as temptation possibly could go. And he never gave in. It's astounding. It's miraculous. It's even supernatural. But this is what Jesus has done. But he can sympathize with you and me and our, sin, our temptation towards it. He knows how powerful that temptation is. He says, I get it. I've been there. I know how hard it is. So it's for us. He understands. Come alongside. Next. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus. Because of God, that's to him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. Bunch of big words there. The key word being righteousness, which would be already defined. So Jesus, in his perfect life, becomes our righteousness. Okay? So here's the importance with this. Uh, the righteousness is, well, let me back up here and say this. We are unrighteous, right? There's not a single soul here that's righteous on his own terms or her own terms. We all sin, which makes us all unrighteous, all unholy, right? In need of redemption. And so where do we get our righteousness to be made right before God? Through our own works, like the elder brother was trying to do? Our own obedience? No, because the law demands we need perfect obedience, and no one has perfect obedience. We all fall short. We're all rebellious. We're all unrighteous. So where does that righteousness come from? Exactly. It comes from Jesus Christ. His perfect life. It's His faithfulness, His righteousness, that's given to us by grace. It's given. It's a gift. We don't earn it. But we have to have faith that Jesus is who he says he is, that he lived the perfect life, he faced temptations as a human being, he overcame, he is the righteous one, he is our Savior. And that's what we have faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior. He did that for us. He climbed El Capitan, which is the, the face of sin and death, and the wrath of death. He climbed that, scaled that for us, and put us on our back, on his back. Because we can't do that. He did that for us. So his righteousness becomes our righteousness. And that's what gets presented to God. He looks at you, God the Father looks at you and sees the faith and the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Christ in you. And not only that, but there's sanctification going on here, which means the, the working this out in our daily life of imaging Christ with one another. Next, I can go on and on with this. Second Corinthians, because Paul does all through the New Testament. This is this is good stuff. I'm going to get a little mark going up here. <laughs> For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There you go. That's what I just said. For our sake, put your name in there. For Jim's sake. For Char's sake. For Walter's sake. For Chuck's sake. He made Jesus to be sin, who knew no sin. He took on our sin. So the righteousness that we got from Jesus, he gave that away. Guess what he took on? Our sinfulness. Our sin, our wrath, our goodness. <clears throat> he took that all himself onto him. Why? So that in him, in Jesus, not in myself, not in anybody else, in Jesus we might become the righteousness of God. That doesn't give you chills. I mean, this, this is good news, friends. Jesus is our righteousness, and in Him, by grace, as a gift, through faith, we are saved. And we can stand. That song that we sang, I, I hope you're tying this all together. It is well with my soul. 
You, you see how powerful that song is? Based on the righteousness of Christ and his perfect life? What was the one stanza at the end? That when Christ comes again, you know why we can say it is well my soul when Christ comes back as the judge? It's going to judge humanity, you and I. You know why it's well with my soul? Because we're going to be judged in the righteousness of Christ and not our own unrighteousness. And that's it as well with your soul and my soul because of what Christ has done for us. Let's go on here. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, and the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. This is, again, summarizing the three temptations that, that were there, and the temptations that we face to, today. Um, we, and I'll quickly flip this around, this is about the righteousness of Jesus Christ, not our righteousness, but yet we are tempted, and we are expected to have a response, the obedience of faith to Jesus Christ, but not like elder brother, in the sense that we earn Christ's favor on us, but, in be, but because of Christ's favor in our life, we respond. But how do we do that? We fight. You know the fight and flight syndrome that is inbuilt with us? Those of you who are in school probably learned this in biology. The rest of us might have forgot about this. But when we face danger, the body is designed to go into fight or flight mode. The adrenal glands pump out adrenaline. Your heart rate goes up. The pupils um, dilated. They, the whole body system gets ready to fight or flee, one of the two. That's what we do with sin. Jesus showed us how to fight. Okay? Paul gets in this too. Put on the full armor of God in Ephesians 6. Right? The helmet of salvation, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. And, you know, and what? The sword. What do you fight with? That's all defensive strategy. The sword. The Word of God. That's exactly what Jesus does here. He takes the sword of the Spirit. He's led out into the desert by the Spirit. The Spirit's with him. And he's using the Word of God. And he's fighting off the enemy. Fight. As disciples, we fight. But we fight with the Word of God and knowing truth of who we are and who Christ is. That's how we get through the deception and lies of the devil, is to know the truth. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth. We know Jesus. Not a truth concept, but Jesus is. So, but sometimes, and I, I submit to you, actually the best thing to do first is flee. Paul talks about flee sexual immorality, flee all these kind of sins. The first thing, you flee from it, so you're not even tempted by it. But if you end up face to face with a temptation, you fight. We fight it. And that's, I submit to you, what it means to follow Jesus. When we're given into temptations, we're no longer following Jesus. We're off path. We're out of line with the truth of the gospel of, of Jesus. To confess and to repent is to come back. Notice what Jesus says when he started his ministry. He called his first disciples to say, follow him. What was the first command? Only command, actually. Repent. Why do we need to repent? Because we're unrighteous. And it reminds us of the righteousness of Jesus Christ and to follow him as our servant. I'm going to close with this. There's a, a picture of some hands here. Take a good look at those hands. Scarred, thick, cut, worn. That's the hands of Alex Honnold. Through the work that he does climbing and training to get up to help Kevin. And those are the hands that got him up. Now, there's another pair of hands as well that we look at, the hands of Christ. Another pair of hands that scale something far more formidable than El Capitan. The hands of Jesus went to the cross and were spread out, and they were crucified and hung there. This is the good news of Jesus Christ, that he took our place. Because of his righteousness, he could go to the cross and say, it is finished. What was finished? The work of being righteous. The work of faithfulness to the Father. I, I believe he said that joyfully. It is finished. I did it. I made it. It is done. No more temptations. No more fighting. And someday we get to say the same thing in Christ. It is done. It is finished. No more fighting. 
No more fleeing. Only flourishing in the love and joy of Jesus Christ. That is the good news that, that we have. And may we as disciples remember Jesus and his righteousness. And we follow him through fighting and fleeing against sin. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your hands have stretched out and have saved us through your perfect life and your death on the cross. May we recognize our sinfulness and our need for a Savior each and every day. May we repent and confess and continually turn back to the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ, and, and that way follow you through life. Thank you for these words that they challenge us and convict us and encourage us to be better disciples of yours in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.